a man who knows personally about the challenges these children and young people will face uh, is best-selling author Dave Pelzer. He wrote a book, uh, a famous book, A Child Called It, chronicling his own story of abuse as a child and survival as a man. Dave Pelzer, the survivor, joins me now in front of that beautiful Golden Gate Bridge. Thank you so much for making your way to a studio to talk to me. This is a conversation that I've wanted to have. Um, I know, or am, am I wrong to say you've been following this case, Dave? Oh, as carefully as you have. And I, I do have to say, and one, thank you for having me on the show. But I've been involved with uh, Child Abuse Awareness Prevention now for going on 30 years. And I think this is the most gruesome, heartbreaking case uh, I've, I've ever come across. And, you know, God bless those children and everybody trying to support them. Because this is going to be a long-term project to, to get these kids back online, to give them the life that they deserve and, you know, move forward. And, and you know, every day from this moment on should be a blessing for them. They certainly deserve it. They, they really do. Um, and when I think about it and I think about your own story, I guess we're talking about sort of two things that are going to happen in parallel. You've got the, the physical, right? Their, their yes. physical well-being, because we know they were severely malnourished. Um, they, were, they were beaten, strangled. Um, they were, the, the mental and, and brain cognition was low because of the malnutrition. But then right. you've also got the psychological scars that and, you and must heal from. And that's long term. Right. So, and, and, and they are going to need, and this is not going to be a quick fix of, uh, you know, three easy payments in 1995. You're talking years of intense therapy. And, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the education aspect of it and their bodies and so forth, trying to keep up with them. But I think for them, it's about safety and gaining or regaining, reprogramming trust that they deserve to have. That yeah. was, you know, taken away from them. You know, I, I was thinking um, about what they, what they would have done to cope during the years in captivity. Um, I suppose, different from your situation, there may have been strength in numbers. Dave, do you think? D yes, definitely. You know, th there's leadership positions that you take and you plan, you do little things to escape. And, and this is almost like a, a POW-like situation. And not everybody's going to be for escaping. Uh, as, as you know, one, one sibling tried to escape and bring another child with her. And at the last moment, the child went back to the house for fear, intimidation. Oh. And th there, for, at this point of, of the case, there's a lot of questions like, why didn't the neighbors do this? Why didn't they escape and so forth? And to me, that's not really the issue that's going to make a difference right now. It's about safety and protecting these kids. Because yeah. you have, to, like you said, you have to deprogram them of, of the, uh, the things that happen against them and then give them another building block to say, OK, this is not your fault. You can move forward. And what I try to tell people is you survive for a reason. Yes. Not to be a perpetual victim because, as we know now, uh, either one or both of the parents were severely abused as a child because this is a learned behavior. Yeah. So now we have to make sure that these children, as break they become the functional adults, break that cycle. And again, that what I always try to, you know, impede that message of happiness, happiness, happiness. I have so many questions for you. I could talk to you for the rest of the day. When we talk about the young girl that was able to escape, you know what I'm moved by, Dave, is that despite the horror that she lived through, despite the torture, the abuse, the neglect, she, they didn't break her spirit. Yes. There was something in this young woman that said, no, no, and, and, and I refuse. The, the, you, and, and I remember in my case, I was eight, and that's like 90% uh, of your psychological makeup is the first eight years when I was burned on the gas stove. I decided afterwards that I'm going to do anything I can to survive, whether it's stealing food, if I wasn't fed or tighten up parts of my body. And, and you know, you, you, there's, there's, there's that push. And once you kind of go pres past that preface, preface you, you can per se do anything in a sense. And that's why, you know, I, I say if you can survive cancer, you can survive a flu. If you can survive being abused, you can survive, you know, just anything that comes your way. But th that's, that's the thing what perpetrators forget is if you push someone a certain way, they may bounce back and be stronger than you can ever possibly mm -hmm. imagine. You mentioned the importance of deprogramming these kids. I, I was thinking about the, the process because especially for some of the little ones, right? They've, they've become attached right. as dysfunctional they don't, they as it don't, is. They don't, they don't know, know any, any different. different, right? They don't, they don't. It's, this is normal in their world, whether it's the younger children or those that have been horribly brainwashed. This is just normal for the perpetrator or pedophile to treat 
these these children in that fashion so that's why it's so important to get a great debriefing and that's gonna you know god bless these social workers and therapists and the office. police officers and foster parents and the, and the da because it's going to take a lot of village to take care of these young adults well especially because as you mentioned if these are the only parents they've ever known even though they were abusive and tortured them and didn't care for them and didn't love for them and didn't protect them it's the only parent they've known, so they are going to miss mommy and daddy. And, and, yes. and how do you explain that to a tiny child? It's, it's hard to explain, and there's not one pill to do that, because I felt when I was rescued that I had betrayed my family from exposing the secret. And then I, I felt shame that my siblings weren't rescued. So there's a, a, you know, an ocean of emotions involved with this. But it's like anything when I work with people and in coming into program per se. It's one breath. It's one day at a time. You do what you can for the now and let things kind of fall into play because this thing could be so overwhelming. Dave, would you say you're at peace now? Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, absolutely, yes. I, I think I was at peace even as it was happening to me, and this is an important statement, I always knew my mommy was sick, and I tried to do whatever I could to win back her approval, mm. to win back her love, to be good enough to be a, a member of a family, but, but even as I was being abused, that, that person abused me was not my mommy, it was just another entity that I took over, and I have to say that both my parents uh, have passed on, and they, they're hopefully both resting in peace, and that's why I, try, I, I run my own program where I make people laugh three times a day. I try to do <laughs> three good deeds a day. I just try to be a good person because I know, Michaela, I should be dead. I should be in prison. I should be a member of a terrorist cell. But I've been given a blessing because of those who invested their time, energy, and love into me. So what is the key there then? Because I know... Um we know about the cycle of abuse, that it can, those who abuse generally were abused. We, do, we want to break the cycle with these kids. We want to give them hope for the future. We want to remind them about the goodness of humanity. But what keeps someone from turning as an adult when these demons get too big? What turns them to what you've done, serving in the military, our first responder, living a life of laughter and goodness, working to help other children? What keeps them from turning to the bottle and, 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 and not feeling like there is hope, that there is no future for them? What is the secret, Dave? I, I, there, I don't know if there is a secret. I mean, that's the multi-billion dollar question in a sense. But I think, you know, you, you, you take these problems in small bite-sized situations, little solutions one day at a time, and as obtuse as it sounds, just, you know, giving them as unconditional love every single day, just like any normal parent would do. And again, to let them know as part of the, depro the uh, deprogramming process, this is not their fault. Right. That should have never have happened. There's going to be a very different scenario for it when you look at these pictures uh, for, the, for the younger children than the older. I mean, it, it's still astounding, and we'll repeat it. Uh, the 29-year-old woman was 82 pounds. She looked like uh, a tween when, the, when rescuers found uh, them. The, the recovery and the future is going to look very different depending on their age. Yes, because right now we're in the honeymoon phase for these kids. It's a new life. There's uh, a lot of sensation involved and so forth. But after things settle down, mm. that's when the work truly begins. And it has to be every day, one day at a time, do all that you can as best as you can. And there's going to be bad days and good days. But now that they're out of that horrific situation, every day has to be better. I think one of the things people are struggling to understand, and I don't know if in the work you have done working within the community, working with um, victims and survivors of abuse, maybe even talking to abusers, I think people are wondering where did we as society fail this family and these children? Where did we go wrong that they were allowed to move about the country, carrying on and living in plain sight? abuse I, their children in such a fashion? I, I, I think there's two answers for that. One, we live in an open society, and it's not the community's res fault or responsibility. This rests solely, and I don't want it to sound too Clint Eastwood-esque on this, this, re this responsibility rests solely on the perpetrators, period. What would you like to tell those kids as, you know, if you were in a quiet room with them, away from the cameras, away from social workers, and you could sit down and have audience with these kiddos and these young people, what would you say to them? 
Well, the first thing I would do is I would definitely give them the biggest hug I could, every single one of them. I would whisper in their ear something in my heart, something in effect of, you know, God bless you. I want you to be strong. I want you to know that you're now loved and you're going to be safe. And every day will get better. And again, you deserve to be happy. What is important for us to know as, as the people, because you said at some point the TV cameras are going to go away. It won't be the headline that is grabbing everybody's attention. What do you want America to know about childhood abuse, about a, a situation like the Turpins? I, I, I think the takeaway is bad things happen to good people every single day, whether it's another school shooting, whether there's a fire in Santa Barbara or Santa Rosa. But the one thing I've learned as a volunteer fire captain is when bad situations happen, sometimes that makes the best of our society. We all come out to help each other out in any way possible. And I think we do live in a new type of world, a new America, that this is not, again, a quick fix, that we still have to be vigilant and do as much as we can to help out our brothers and sisters and our neighbors and our communities as a whole. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I've been moved by getting out there to Paris and seeing the memorial that's growing, um, honoring those kids, the amount of people that are calling into the hospital foundation to donate. Uh, there are many people that have been touched by abuse, have been touched by this story, or just like you, just have a good heart and want to, want to see these kids uh, have a bright future. That has moved me to, to no end. Dave Pelzer, thank you. I know you don't do this very often, but you, you made an exception for us. Thank you for being here to talk about this. And thank you for the work that you're doing. God bless. You as well, Dave.